Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Kirti Chadda, the Chief Scientific Officer and Senior Oncopathologist at Metropolis Healthcare Limited. Today is indeed a very special day, the World Cancer Day. What exactly is the World Cancer Day and what is the initiative the global leaders have taken on this? There is a 2022 to 2024 campaign which has been launched and this awareness is most critical in the current pandemic scenario. Because while we have all been treating the COVID cases, the other cases have suffered a bit. There is a huge tendency as depicted in the global and the national statistics. So this 4th of February, 2022, let us all get together and actively support the UICC initiative of Close the Care Gap. These cancer patients need our care. And this initiative will continue into 2023 about uniting our voices and taking action. And finally, in 2024, there is together, we challenge those in power. Now with this strategy well in place, let me introduce the topic for the day. A very, very significant cancer, a reason for high mortality, lung cancer. Today we have with us none other than Dr. Narayan Kuti Warrior, medical oncologist and medical director from the MVR Cancer Center to discuss about lung cancer, the disease burden, diagnosis and treatment. So let us hear it from the expert. Just to introduce him, he has been a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, UK. Apart from being the medical director, he also handles huge responsibilities globally. He has been inducted as a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in 2019, selected as one of the 12 world leaders of oncology by 2018 American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting that was held in 2018. He has received the Center State Award and multiple state awards. He is a member of various associations and focuses very closely in this space that we will be discussing today. So welcome, uh, sir. I introduce you to the crowd. And uh, uh, I would like to begin by you, know, you introducing to everybody what exactly lung cancer disease burden is today globally and in India. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kirti, uh, for the nice introduction and uh, uh, and the very uh, welcome initiative uh, on the Cancer Day. Uh, lung cancer, as uh, you have already mentioned, uh, it's a, a, a global problem, and it's a, a, in the, uh, the burden of lung cancer is being in, increased. Uh, on uh, on a daily basis, and if you uh, ask me what uh, or how many cases are, are you are uh, uh, am I seeing every day in my clinic? Uh, it's almost uh, uh, four or five new cases of uh, lung cancer per day. I'm seeing uh, for, for the last uh, five or six years, and uh, this particular incidence is on the rise. And probably uh, another couple of years, I will be uh, seeing around uh, six or seven cases per day. And uh, when you uh, look at the, uh, the total number, I probably, uh, if you calculate that, I'm uh, sitting in, uh, sitting almost 20 days per month, I will be seeing around uh, 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 about uh, 80, uh, 80 to 100 cases per month. And the, uh, uh, the, when you calculate the total number of cancer, the lung cancer cases coming to my OP per year would be uh, somewhere around 1,000 to 1,200. And uh, uh, when you compare the, this particular incidence uh, uh, to uh, 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 about 10 years back, uh, you can see that it is uh, merely a, some somewhere around uh, 400 or 500. I can say, tell you that it's about uh, the uh, the incidence has almost doubled, partly due to the uh, the awareness created, as well as uh, the uh, good uh, uh, diagnostic modalities we are ha having right now, and uh, and also some of the pandemic is actually the during the pandemic the diagnosed the. People, uh, more people are getting diagnosed because uh, majority of them have uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, getting screened for uh, the COVID-related issues, and on that uh, uh, they, they are pick, uh, picking up a lot of uh, lung cancer cases. So, uh, for the last two years, the incidence has uh, in, uh, really gone up, and, uh, <clears throat> and the, that's right. I noted the, that a lot too. 
that, you know, a lot of cases who were actually getting a CT scan for COVID, you know, landed up uh, being diagnosed with lung cancer. But that would have been a blessing in disguise because, you know, earlier people used to get diagnosed in higher stages. So do you think that this early stage diagnosis is going to help us to attack the problem earlier? You can't say, you can't uh, clearly say whether uh, uh, our, uh, whether uh, we are diagnosing lung cancers uh, uh, early in the course of disease right now because of the COVID. But uh, uh, we can only say that the number of uh, cases uh, being diagnosed have gone up. That is the only okay. observation we, okay. we can make. And some of the cases, um, the, we can definitely say that there is a delay in uh, getting the diagnosis. The reason being because of the co because of the COVID situation, they are more afraid to go to the hospital to check up to do a checkup. So that right. that also is there. So you think the proportion will remain the same of the stage, you know, the various yeah. stage diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yes, there is now the pickup is more, but still people are not coming for treatment. Not coming. Correct. So yeah, yeah. So which are the modalities that you use? And you know, obviously nowhere else the treatment has impacted overall survival better as in lung cancer, whether it be targeted therapy or immunotherapy. Uh, and uh, how many of your patients are actually amenable to surgery? And how many go in for targeted therapy and immunotherapy, respectively? Yeah, that's a, a, a very pertinent uh, question. Uh, though we make diagnosis, uh, majority of our patients uh, are diagnosed in the advanced stage, like uh, uh, to stage three or stage four. Uh, I can uh, tell you it's about uh, 80 20%. 80% 80 of our uh, patients are uh, uh, being diagnosed in uh, stage 3 uh, and uh, uh, stage 3 and stage 4. And 20% are in the early stages like uh, stage 2 and stage 1. And uh, probably in the last uh, couple of uh, uh, couple of years, uh, you can say, uh, due to the increased uh, awareness, we are able to uh, make some improvements uh, in the, uh, the the stages stage at which the diagnosis is made. Previously, it used to be 90 or even more than 90 percent of them are diagnosed in stage four or stage three. And uh, there's a slight improvement you can see because of the awareness created. So right now we have 80% okay. uh, of uh, lung cancers are diagnosed in the stage three or stage four and 20% uh, in the early stage. And out of the early stage, uh, I, I can tell you about 50% uh, uh, of them will go for surgery. So when you uh, consider the total number of lung cancers, I can tell you that uh, the 10 to 20% of cases will go for uh, surgery and the rest will be uh, managed with uh, other modalities of treatment, mainly the radiation as well as uh, the chemotherapy. That's a really, really large burden of cases in higher stage, right? Uh, so apart from radio and chemo, uh, you know, how many patients are actually, they're able to afford, you know, all the molecular oncology techniques and uh, next generation sequencing and other, so that you can offer them targeted therapy. Uh, how many Indian patients do you think actually are able to afford the diagnosis and the treatment for a better survival? Yeah, that's uh, again uh, another important question. Uh, th we are all following certain guidelines and uh, uh, ac uh, according to the guidelines, we are uh, uh, supposed to do the NGS or do the molecular testing. And with the based on the molecular testing, uh, we can find out better treatment options. And the, you know the, the treatment options are uh, getting improved uh, day by day. So one has to offer the uh, uh, latest treatment and, and also uh, the most uh, uh, viable treatment option for a particular patient. So uh, a doc, an oncologist is supposed to see the, the latest treatment modality. So he has to design a latest modality of treatment for uh, his patient. So uh, uh, without the molecular diagnosis, you cannot proceed further. The moment you make a diagnosis of uh, lung cancer, the next thing one has to go for uh, is the molecular testing. So without the molecular testing, uh, a particular patient cannot be treated. So knowing uh, the molecular uh, milieu of the, uh, the lung cancer in a particular patient is very, very important. And that saves a lot of uh, 
money as well as a lot of uh, uh, lives absolutely so when we looked at our cancer data actually from 2015 to 2021 uh, if we look at lung tissue you know the various ways in which we get lung tissue whether it is a core needle biopsy or endobronchial biopsy so we realized that about uh, 15% of the cases turned out to be malignant thankfully 85% were still benign and out of these as you said very correctly a good number of the malignant uh, was you know underwent molecular analysis and uh, we found egfr as the most common mutation 29 to 30% of the cases actually had uh, you know egfr out of which exon 19 was the most common of 65% and then of course was followed by alk in about 8% of the cases and then a little bit of red met uh, you know ross and now of course we have the BRAF and the ntrk fusions so do you see a similar kind of positivity in your practice uh, uh, yeah almost uh, but uh, indian patients have uh, higher uh, uh, EGFR positivity and uh, uh, in our hospital also we see around 30%, 30 to 35% of our lung cancer patients are uh, were tested positive for EGFR and uh, 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 but if you look at the world statistics it is around 20-22-25%. Right, so absolutely I think in India we're seeing a little more of EGFR more and of ALK as compared to the world, yes. Uh, also, so how frequently do you use a liquid biopsy, especially in the 790M, you know, the resistance, especially when the patient is already on uh, EGFR and EGFR therapy? How often do you use liquid biopsy? Is it still uh, something that is you would recommend or, you know, or you think we have to still wait for more data? Yeah, Girti, uh, it's a... Uh... Uh, uh, liquid biopsy has come up in a big way and uh, as a, uh, a very important tool, especially when uh, uh, all of you know that uh, there, there can be difficulty in getting the tissue. Uh, 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 when you are doing uh, biopsy, sometimes it is very, very difficult to get tissue, adequate tissue for all the molecular testing. And because nowadays the pathology is uh, so much advanced, one has to go for the immunohistochemistry and uh, the half of the tissue they will be uh, taking for uh, immunohistochemistry, then uh, half will be for the morphology. Uh, so uh, then uh, it will be uh, only very little tissue will be left for uh, doing the molecular testing. So this is what uh, what is what is happening right now. So uh, getting uh, repeat biopsy or telling the patient uh, to go for repeat bi biopsy is something which is very uh, traumatic. So uh, we cannot tell them. Uh, so, uh, in this context, uh, the liquid biopsy has come up uh, with a great hope. But however, uh, in our own experience, uh, the liquid biopsy gives. Uh, only uh, uh, only uh, liquid biopsy uh, coming positive uh, it's only for 15 to 20 percent of the our patients the rest of we are, so far we were not able to get uh, uh, more than that so uh, practically uh, uh, we cannot uh, we cannot we can only tell the patient that there is a method uh, and if you are lucky you will be getting the positive result but otherwise uh, majority of the time uh, it may not uh, yield any result. So prob uh, I feel that uh, this uh, low uh, uh, results, low percentage of results are uh, especially due to the, the, tech, the, the possibility of uh, the learning curve and we need to improve our technique. Uh, and if you look at the all other major tests or complicated tests which were introduced in, uh, in the late, uh, 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 the, the early part of uh, the uh, this century, uh, majority of them uh, were like this, especially the the HER2 uh, testing and all. Uh, there was a yes. very long learning curve, and uh, after Absolutely. that, uh, uh, now uh, yeah, we have mastered it. So similarly, yes. uh, the liquid biopsy needs uh, some more uh, time uh, for the learning curve to disappear. Okay. Right, right. So you raised very, very uh, three uh, pertinent points. So just to reiterate them for our audience, 
the first thing is uh, you know tissue is very precious and tissue is the issue most of the time so please do not waste tissue uh, if on morphology you can see the glands you don't need to do a full iac you know panel for it just a couple of markers to close that it's a non small cell small cell uh, mm-hmm. i would request you all right. please do not waste ribbons of tissue on doing iac panels because this tissue is very very precious to do whole lot of molecular testing so that is the first advice the second advice uh, you know as very correctly pointed out that we have to watch our positivity so this is very important like for example people thought that indian breast cancer was different we had low erpr and you know not a good enough for two but that scenario changed today we all know that 70 to 80% of our breast cancer cases are uh, show high good positivity good average score for erpr and even we see 25 to 30% cases positive for hot to new so this learning curve has to be extended to lung cancer as well uh, okay. so what we noted what you said about technology is so important we are using the digital droplet pcr for the liquid biopsy and we actually noted a higher percentage slightly higher you know from 24% to 28% so i think as you very correctly mentioned we have to keep watching our percentages and you know keep on improving the technology and the quality mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that's a very very important point thank you for that input, one more uh, advice, one more advice yes. one more request to our uh, uh, a uh, copathologist uh, uh, the, impo- the uh, uh, one uh, i think uh, the pathologists are reluctant to report without isc that is the reason why uh, they uh, they always advise isc <laughs> they, they, they they think that uh, without uh, um, or at least one word like uh, 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 correlate with isc uh, without that uh, in the uh, in the uh, um, report Uh, they think that it is incomplete or it, yes. it also some of my colleagues are thinking that uh, it protects them uh, against the medical legal issues and uh, so on but uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, i think for lung if you are pretty sure about the morphology you don't have to ask for ihc just for the sake of completion so uh, uh, this is a very important request because uh, the tissue is very precious and we cannot uh, spare uh, much tissue for uh, for ihc Okay. Yes, yes. That's a very important point. So to all my fellow pathologists, I think we have to realize where are we using the IHC, right? So if it is a diagnosis, like obviously you cannot subtype a lymphoma without doing IHC. Then whether it's for prediction, so like, you know, ERP or KI or a PD-L1 or whatever, but, uh, or it's for companion diagnostics, heronostics. But as Dr. Warrior said very correctly, in lung, IHC does not have that much of a space. If you can see the glands or if you can see the keratinization, close the case you know do not waste tissue on ihc very very pertinent point thank you dr warrior yeah yeah, yeah. so with that we'll move to an ihc related thing where we do need ihc now and that is the immunotherapy the pdl one uh, would you like to throw some light on this area yeah definitely we, we can so what is your experience how many of your cases are actually positive for pdl one and good significant positivity more than 50% and are going in for immunotherapy yeah the pdl1 uh, testing is again uh, another area of uh, 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 interest especially in the wake of uh, uh, more and more patients are going for asking for immunotherapy so uh, uh, pdl1 testing is uh, pretty standardized now uh, yeah, we have uh, 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 again the pa- the reporting pattern also is slightly different Uh, so any uh, uh, pdl1 percentage uh, more than 1% uh, is taken as uh, uh, um, suitable for uh, treatment so we ca- classify them into 1% to 50% and uh, more than 50% so this is two uh, criteria so uh, uh, less than 1% can be t- considered as uh, not eligible for immunotherapy so between 1 to 50% uh, they are eligible uh, for uh, immunotherapy along with chemotherapy and more than 50% such patients you can treat uh, uh, treat them with uh, immunotherapy alone so this is the importance of knowing the percentage of uh, the pdl1 so pdl1 um, is uh, uh, you cannot say that how many percent of patients are positive for uh, pdl1 but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the we are, when we are looking at uh, those who are having pdl1 percentage uh, more than 50% uh, uh, would be somewhere around uh, 
5 to 10 percent only not more than that and between 1 percent and 50 percent uh, you can uh, add uh, another uh, 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 10 to 15 percent so all together uh, 25 to 30 percent of our patients will be eligible for immunotherapy based on the ptl1 status Absolutely. So we've seen similar statistics. So, you know, we get cases from across the globe and we were one of the first labs to start uh, PDL one mm -hmm. uh, We started in 2017. And when I look back at the data from 2017 till now, of all the cases that we have done, I, you know, that is the ratio that when we look at lung, about, you know, 67% cases were negative and 32 okay. were positive. But other than lung, we saw actually a positivity only of 20%. And as you correctly said, from the positive case, Cases, again, 65% were less than 50% positive and 34% uh, were more than 50. So, very similar indices over there. And yes, we have to call it a PDL1 expressor. And then we have to give the tumor proportion score, whether it's less than one, one to 49%, and more than 50%. So, um, yes, that's a very, very valid uh, input over there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moya. Uh, so uh, now, what do you think is the scenario for the drugs in India? So we do all these tests, but then what is the availability of the drugs and how many Indian cancer patients are you know, easily uh, getting these drugs and getting successfully treated? Yeah, uh, again, uh, uh, the, the coming back to the molecular testing, I just wanted to add something when you were talking about the molecular testing. EG, though, sure, the, sure, please, please yeah. go ahead. Though, though EGFR uh, was the common, the commonest uh, uh, abnormality picked up, uh, we are currently we have about uh, ten other molecular abnormalities as well in the uh, lung cancer. So we uh, right now we are looking for uh, various uh, molecular uh, mutations right from uh, uh, EGFR. Uh, or we can call this, we can call uh, uh, molecular uh, alterations right from EGFR mutation to uh, the uh, RET, MET, uh, BRAF sort of uh, uh, molecular alterations. And the importance of these molecular alterations, so we, currently we have uh, um, drugs uh, directed for uh, driver mutations uh, for uh, in the lung cancer, it's about uh, 10 in number. So uh, when you uh, when uh, when you look at the percentage of uh, lung cancer patients positive in each category, uh, uh, we have already mentioned about uh, EGFR, which is about 20 to 25 percent uh, globally. Then about five percent uh, uh, of lung cancers are positive for uh, ALK mutations, and for another five percent for MET uh, mutation positive then uh, probably one to two percent uh, positive in the other category like BRAF and uh, uh, the RET, MET and uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, other more type of molecular alterations. ROS, yes. We have seen yeah, a few ROS, ROS cases yeah. also. Definitely, yeah. definitely ROS also. So the importance of uh, uh, these mutations, we have currently, we have uh, identified drugs for them, but even though uh, the uh, quite number of uh, uh, the drugs are not available in India, but we can try to get it uh, on a compassionate basis uh, from the manufacturers. Uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, what we have found out is uh, these uh, companies are helpful. Um, so uh, once we identify the particular type of mutation, then we can uh, uh, we can request the manufacturer if they are uh, not available in India for a compassionate use. And uh, uh, very often uh, we will be successful in getting one. But uh, uh, for practical purpose, uh, we can uh, we have only. Uh, drugs uh, against uh, EGFR, ALK, ROS uh, uh, mutations only. So uh, commonly uh, used molecular testing uh, uh, will be limited to EGFR, ALK, and ROS, and sometimes uh, uh, PDL1 as well. In our hospital, we we have sh uh, shifted to the NGS uh, testing. So with the NGS, we can do a, a lot of uh, molecular alterations. But again, uh, uh, when the, you don't have anything to offer them, even if you find out uh, these molecular alterations, it is extremely difficult to, uh, to convince the patient uh, uh, when you find out something in the NGS. So this is one scenario. Then uh, the second scenario is about uh, 
the pdl1 uh, testing pdl1 uh, testing is not that costly uh, uh, it will be less than some 3000 rupees uh, in, uh, in our hospital but the problem is the the drug recommended for a particular uh, situation like the, uh, when uh, you are uh, when you uh, find out that uh, uh, the particular patient has got uh, mm, pdl1 percentage more than 50% the pet patient is eligible for immunotherapy and uh, if it is more than 50 percent it is the patient can be treated with immunotherapy alone and many uh, patients are, uh, uh, are uh, <clears throat> afraid of uh, chemo the word chemotherapy so uh, they can uh, they are very uh, probably by the time they get the diagnosis they will google out and uh, they will find out that uh, there is a drug called immunotherapy but when you hear the uh, cost of these particular uh, treatment, and they all uh, will back up and uh, uh, leaving uh, the, the test uh, without any use at all. So the just mere finding out of uh, PDL one uh, uh, will not help. So before uh, before asking for a particular test, uh, you find out whether the particular patient, even if you find this particular uh, the testing is positive. Uh, uh, will you be able to use a, a particular drug for that particular condition in that given patient? So that is very, very important. So uh, immunotherapy is a very costly uh, treatment option and each uh, therapy will cost a patient uh, about uh, three to four lakhs. And when you uh, see the duration of treatment, it is almost uh, two years. Uh, at least uh, you may have to use it for six months to find out whether the particular drug is working or not. So it is uh, going to be extremely uh, a costly effort. So uh, uh, even if you are uh, detecting PDL1 status, uh, uh, you may not be able to treat a particular patient. But uh, having said about this, uh, 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 very often uh, uh, our uh, molecular testing includes all this and uh, an array, a battery of investigations, and probably the significance of all uh, of doing all this molecular testing is for uh, future. Like uh, when you treat these patients uh, with the, uh, the available uh, treatment right now, then uh, later if you find that find that the patients are uh, go, this particular patient is uh, tested positive for a particular molecular alteration, you can uh, uh, convince the patient or you can uh, just wait uh, till uh, the particular drug is available. And once the drug is available, you can definitely uh, uh, advise them uh, to go for this. So that is the advantage of doing the uh, testing. So uh, uh, for everything, there, there can be two sides and uh, uh, one has to weigh the advantages and disadvantages and find out uh, uh, in your own way whether the particular testing uh, will be helpful to a particular patient. This is what my concept is, Kirti. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's another very, very important point that you have put that uh, yes, you know, while doing a test or while thinking of a treatment, one India being a resource poor country, one has to be very cautious about what one is using and uh, whether the drug is available, whether the test is going to be of any use. But then again, as you said on the other side, you know, you have to be able to go into the depth of something and uh, you, know, you have to know the pathophysiology uh, to know the prognosis of the disease and so that we have better outcomes in the future. So this is, uh, that is a very, very pertinent point. So uh, now to, you know, to uh, move away from hardcore, uh, you know, area, uh, would you like, what advice would you like to give to our listeners on World Cancer Day, especially considering the high number of smokers, men or women, and even now vaping that is very common, was very common in the US and now even in India, uh, it's moved from the Western to our country. Uh, and it's freely available online and our youngsters have also started doing all kind of, uh, you know, uh, abuse. So what do you, what advice would you like to give to, you know, this uh, whole population? Uh, yeah, if you look at the uh, uh, causes of lung cancer, you can see that uh, more than 80% uh, of lung cancers are caused by uh, tobacco. And uh, uh, the rest is uh, uh, environmental pollution and uh, passive smoking and other types of rare conditions, rare, rare causative factors like uh, uh, asbestos uh, exposure and uh, uh, radon exposure and so on. But by and large, 80% of the uh, lung cancers are associated with uh, uh, tobacco use. And uh, if you look at the mortality, you can see that uh, uh, about 
thirty uh, percent of all uh, uh, cancer deaths are due to uh, tobacco related cancers. So, yeah, uh, it's very very important that uh, we make aware about uh, uh, these causative factors. And I don't think that uh, right now uh, anybody uh, is not aware of uh, uh, the, the relationship between the smoking and the lung cancer. But even after knowing very well that uh, smoking or tobacco use causes cancer, they still continue to smoke. So uh, uh, helping them identifying uh, these uh, these population uh, very early in the uh, uh, this habit and making them aware about uh, uh, the bad effects of uh, smoking as well as uh, uh, gi uh, giving them uh, good counseling and and also uh, 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 recently I read an article uh, about uh, uh, the tobacco use uh, among children. And I came to know that eighty uh, percent um, of our teachers in the schools are uh, not uh, trained uh, uh, to deal with such situation. How to identify children who are in the habit of smoking, as well as how to counsel them, also uh, how to deal with uh, uh, when, when somebody when a, a teacher sees a, a child uh, uh, smoking. So this is how uh, things are going in our country. So uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, lot more to do for such uh, population. And uh, the general advice is uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, learn about the, uh, or identify about the uh, 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 bad effects of smoking. And uh, uh, even if you think that uh, uh, smoking uh, on, only for, a, uh, if, even if you are planning to smoke only for a, a few months in your life, uh, that itself uh, can cause cancer later. So uh, uh, be aware of the bad effects of uh, uh, smoking and the tobacco use and abstain from such bad habits. Also, uh, you can probably, the best way of uh, 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 staying away from uh, such bad habits is to uh, work with the uh, NGOs who are involved in uh, uh, creating awareness about uh, smoking and cancer. So my advice to all our young population is, uh, uh, please do not get into uh, the bad habit of uh, uh, tobacco use. And uh, I have seen uh, people coming, especially uh, uh, the uh, uh, cancer, the, the oral cavity cancers, and the majority, many of them, uh, I'm not saying majority, many of them are in the early 30s. And when you ask them, when you go into the de in the depth of their history, you can see that uh, they had uh, uh, used tobacco only for uh, uh, one or two years in their life. And thereafter, they stopped, but still they got the disease. So two years in somebody's life is a very small period, but they are left with the uh, incurable cancers. So my plea to all the uh, youngsters, uh, whoever is uh, uh, hearing this podcast is not to get involved with the uh, tobacco use. If that will save a lot of your uh, money as well as uh, 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 that will save you from a lot of disease, not only cancer, but uh, uh, the cardiac as well as the other respiratory, crippling respiratory diseases. So this is what I want to uh, tell you. Thank you so much. Uh, so for all of you out there, that was very, very strong advice from an expert. Please pay heed and, you know, uh, contribute and uh, stay away from these things. Uh, so to end uh, this podcast, uh, I think it would be best, Dr. Warrior, as a global and national leader on oncology, if there is any, uh, you know, last uh, words that you would like to say, uh, what do you see, you know, what is the situation of this much feared word cancer? And how do you think India is moving and how is the next decade going to shape up in this uh, segment? Yeah. Uh, next year, 10 years, uh, uh, probably we can say next decade is going to be a very crucial uh, uh, period for us. Uh, the, we see that uh, there is a, a tremendous explosion of knowledge in the field of cancer and more and more uh, treatment modalities are coming to the field of uh, oncology and uh, uh, these knowledges and this knowledge is uh, being uh, translated into 
uh, treatment modalities and uh, thereby uh, uh, helping patients to uh, uh, get complete cure from the cancer. So cancer is no longer uh, a bad disease. C cancer is a, a curable disease. And that uh, uh, message should reach all the people uh, uh, across uh, uh, India, uh, the, both uh, uh, urban and rural areas, because uh, I think urban population is already aware of all the um, uh, aspects of uh, uh, cancer, but uh, uh, rural area is still behind. And many of them think that uh, cancer is an incurable disease and there is a lot of stigma is associated with uh, uh, cancer. So the next 10 years uh, is going to be a, the <coughs> very uh, crucial, uh, crucial period for India. We need to work uh, together towards uh, changing this uh, concept and uh, changing uh, myths about cancer in the rural population so that everybody will go for uh, testing early in the course of disease and uh, thereby, thereby we can uh, detect uh, cancers early and thereby we can treat uh, cancer as a uh, just as a simple disease just like any other disease where uh, you don't have to worry about uh, the outcome and uh, cancer is the the good effects of uh, early detection can be uh, offered to all our cancer patients uh, across the country. So this is what uh, the, the, our vision. And uh, we all, uh, uh, both the clinicians and the, the uh, laboratory personnel and the paraclinics and all the healthcare workers should work together uh, towards the achieving this goal. So this is uh, uh, my future uh, vision. Absolutely, absolutely, Dr. Warrior. So on that positive note, we come to an end. Cancer is preventable and curable, but not without awareness, resources, expertise, and engagement, collaboration. So on that note, thank you for listening. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you all.